Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. So I'm Megan. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Megan. Um, hi, guys. The first time I came into AA was in September 2007. Um, however, my sobriety date is August 3rd, 2015. So almost a decade I've been coming in and out of the rooms. Um, and what it was like, I grew up around here. I was born in San Francisco, grew up in Piedmont. Um, my mom was born in San Francisco. My grandmother was born in Oakland. So, yes, I'm a unicorn. <laughs> um, but so I came from an alcoholic home. And it was totally normal to drink a huge Catholic family, non-practicing Catholic. Um, And yeah, that was super normal. So even when I was a kid, one of my friend's dads was like an alcoholic in AA. And I remember my mom saying that if you ever go to a party and someone's not drinking, stay away from them because they're probably an alcoholic. Like, I kid you not. They're probably an alcoholic and they talk about God and like stay away. So that was sincerely the attitude in my family. I don't really think about it. It's ironic. My brother's in AA. My other brother's been in and out of rehab. Go figure. Um, so yeah, and I had a good time drinking for the most part. I drank in high school, you know, got into some other stuff like mushrooms, crystal, ecstasy. I don't know. Some of those raver, raver drugs, even though I was like a punk rocker and it just shows what drugs can you do to you. I went to a rave and did ecstasy and it was like overnight. I was like, yeah, but, um, <laughs> so, yeah, change, change things. Um, so yeah, high school experimentation. I had some friends who went to rehab for crystal and I always thought like, Hey, I can just do this on the weekends. And, um, you know, also being emo high schooler, like kind of suicidal, but I went to college, more drinking, a little cocaine. And again, you know, there were those nights that I felt like the loneliest person in the world and just hating myself, hating everyone else. For the most part, I had a pretty good time. Um, and so I moved to New York City to work in the music industry. And I became a bartender and played in a few bands. And again, it was, like, awesome. I had a great time. I drank. I got into cocaine, but the same thing. I was like, you know, I bought cocaine, like, five times in my life. But I would probably do it six days a week because it was there. If anything was in front of me, I'd do it. And... You know, for the most part, it was okay. Like, I have friends that I'm still friends with today that I partied with. Um, But things worked until they didn't. Um, I could take time off drinking. And, um, well, just a little about my drinking. So I'd wake up. I'd get a fancy latte. latte, I'd go to the bar at 4 because I was nocturnal. And I put whiskey in my latte. But I didn't feel bad. Like, that was normal. Everyone I knew was partying. Like, it's just, like it says in the book, it just became my normal life. Um, you know, damn time. Totally. So, um, so, so, yeah. And, like, my bosses, you know, did blow and were like, hey, I need to talk to you. And we just, like, do a bump and a few shots. And, um, you know, people talk about how they are worried that there's not going to be enough. Yeah, that never happened to me because... Being a bartender, bars are open till four. If you're in charge, there's after hours till seven. A lot of liquor stores open at six. You can get anything delivered and shit is everywhere. So I was just like, hey, you know. And um, so, yeah, so I got into grad school. I took a month off drinking and I could, you know, kind of function. I had like bouts of depression and like, suicidal ideation and stuff like that. But, um, And I always knew I was, like, a little bit off, but, um, so I got into a school that I never thought I would get into. I had my own apartment for the first time, and I felt like shit, and I stopped drinking for five days, and this was happening before I stopped drinking. Like, I'd walk from point A to point B and be just sobbing. Like, I couldn't stop sobbing. 
And then I see someone I know, I'm like, oh, hey, how are you? Yeah, allergies. And just, like, hate everything. And, like, I mean, basically, to make a long story short, I'm bipolar one. And I was losing my mind. I was hearing voices. I was paranoid um, about weird things like construction workers, transparent thoughts where, like, I'd be standing up here and everyone could see my thoughts. Um, and, you know, that had happened to me on drugs, but I was, like, it, I mean, it was awful. So I went into the psych ward, and um, I was just like, help me. And, oh, and before I went in there, I had a shrink, and she was like, you know, maybe you should try AA. And I was like, that was hysterical. Like, I started laughing, and I was like, why? And she's like, well, I think, you know, or you're an alcoholic. And I was like, yeah, but, like, why is this happening to me? Why am I losing my mind? Like, I didn't connect it, you know? And um, even then, oh, thank you. Anyway, so, lost my mind, um, got out of the hospital, over-medicated. I couldn't, I got into grad school, I couldn't read, I couldn't tie my shoes. So, basically, an eight-month program, I just went, and it was for people who engaged in self-harm, like, high-functioning people. There was... Um, a substance abuse element, but basically I stopped trusting doctors, you know, because I would feel better and I could connect to people when I was fucked up. When I was on those medications, I wasn't hurting myself, but I couldn't think like I would get lost walking to my own apartment from the subway. So I think that's a huge reason I had a lot of um, problems coming in and out. But, um, oh, yeah, that's why I got into heroin. <laughs> Not that part. Um, you know, and started selling drugs. So, yeah, things went downhill pretty fast. Um, but anyway, just coming in and out in terms of, like, spiritual experiences, I think I had a lot. And I feel like it was sand. Like, I would grab it and it would be amazing and just, like, fall through my fingers and I went to AA a lot, and um, I didn't announce myself as a newcomer. I didn't talk to people. It's New York City, so you can be a little more anonymous. And um, and people would talk about their 90 days, and they feel great. And I fucking would shake and be like, I hate them. And they were either lying or full of shit, or they weren't a real junkie. They weren't a real alcoholic. You know, they were fucking lame and needed friends or whatever. I was just, you know, sick of Tinder. Who knows? But um, I was just so angry. And I had to go to AA to get back into school. That was, like, my thing, why I kept going. And sometimes I don't know why I kept going. I think I just love to hate things. So <laughs> it's an easy place to do that. Um, but, uh, but for the newcomer, I think, again, the most important thing is sharing and just showing up. Because even now, I'm late to, like, every meeting. And I think about it as, like, if it was almost last call, what am I going to be like, no, I'm not going like, I'd fucking run my ass there, you know, and I don't care if there was five minutes left, um, which is how you know. Um, but anyway, so in terms of higher power, I know that stuff is really hard, the God stuff. I think, you know, most people battle with that. Um, and mine changes all the time. Like, at first, it was my dog, um, you know. Now it's like my sponsor told me to watch The Never Ending Story, and I wear this because, like, I don't know, you guys should watch that movie. Anyway, so it's, it's just, it just changes a lot. And, um, and yeah, I think today there are things that I want that I didn't, didn't even occur to me before, like things like integrity and dignity and pausing and, you know, taking action versus reaction and letting go, but also doing my best before I do that. I mean, all this stuff happens very rarely to me, but it's really exciting when it does, you know, and being quiet and like listening to my gut when you know something's a little bit wrong instead of just doing it anyway, like heroin. I was like, whatever. Yeah, fuck yeah, I'll do it and it will be fine. What an idiot, you know, and, um, and just little things like that and really being quiet and trying to, you know, for me, quiet my mind, which is really hard. And with the whole medication thing, um, you know, I need a mind altering substance to be in the world. <laughs> like, otherwise I'm in the psych ward and 
that's really difficult. And I know this is AA, but especially if people are dual diagnosis, like I really encourage you to share about it because I feel like I had so much shame and just coming to this program and telling people and they like laugh and they're like, yeah, I'm bipolar too. Like, yeah, I set my apartment on fire too. It's hilarious. <laughs> um, you know, uh, when you're a, whatever. Um, anyway. And so, yeah, I think the release of shame and again, just like no one does this perfectly. I felt like people were judging me. Um, you know, for being like a perpetual newcomer, for being late for this, for that. And like, A, no one cares, and B, if they do, fuck them, you know? So just like, yeah, just just do your best. I hate to be cliche and say keep coming back, but, um, you know, I finally have a year, and hopefully I'll have a little bit more time, but um, sometimes quickly and sometimes slowly. But I think you still learn a lot, even, even if you relapse. You know, people can't take those thoughts and those feelings and, um, and, uh, those aha moments away from you. So anyway, that's all I got. <laughs> Thanks. Now I'd like to turn the meeting over to our main speaker, Patrick. I'm Patrick. I'm alcoholic. Hi, Patrick. Hey. Hey. <clears throat> um, okay. So what it was like, what everyone is like now, um, Thank you for having me. Thank you for asking me to share. Um, I don't know, like, uh, I grew up, like, I grew up in Colorado, and I grew up in, like, a somewhat normal household, like, like, there's a lot of, like, physical and, like, verbal and sexual abuse, and, like, my mind made that a really big deal, like, it made it a lot worse than it was to use it as an excuse for a long time. Um, but basically, I remember from growing up that I was always in a lot of fear. Right, like fear always determined all of my decisions, and uh, and so uh, like my brother like would just beat the crap out of me all the time, and like I I don't know I was super codependent or something, so I continued to try to like hang out with him, and like he just keep beating me up. I don't know really what I was thinking, but uh, and so. Yeah, like I said, I grew up in a lot of fear. Um, when I was about 10, I moved to California with my family. Um, and, uh, like, I moved to Pleasanton. And, like, I don't know, like, it, the same thing happened while I was here. Like, my brother beat me up. Like, my dad, like, well, not when we moved to California, but my dad used to beat me up, too. And, uh, and so, like, I remember when I was in high school, um, my mom was giving me a ride home from high school, and uh, she told me I was her favorite. Like, I got two brothers and a sister. And uh, I don't know. That didn't seem like a good thing to me because I thought my mom was insane. And so <laughs> I was like, I do not want to be this lady's favorite. Right? And um, basically, like, I grew up in religion. I didn't think I was ever going to, like, do drugs or drink. Obviously, that didn't happen. But... Uh, that's what I grew up thinking. And so after my mom said that, um, I went home and I went to the fridge and I grabbed a bottle of champagne and I chugged it. And uh, then I went and saw the movie The Passion of the Christ with a bunch of church friends. <laughs> yeah. But uh, after that, like, I had all these things against drinking, like I was super straight edge or whatever it was. Like, But after I drank, I realized what it could do, which was remove all of that fear that I have always had, right? It made me feel better with very little effort on my part. And I hate effort, so that was awesome. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, um, a couple days later, um, I remember I got this bum to buy me and my friends some 40s, and uh, I got super wasted. And I went to high school the next day, and I remember having my first hangover, and I was like, this sucks. And I remember telling my girlfriend I'm never going to drink again. And I went home, and I got some more 40s, and uh, I did that almost every single day for the first six months after I started drinking, because, like, I had a lot of fear, and, like, once you realize that something can take it away, like, why not do it all the time? And so, uh, it didn't really affect my grades, because I was already flunking everything anyways. Um, <laughs> but basically, uh, so, I was, like I said, I was drinking almost every single day for the first six months after I started drinking, and, like, me and my friends would just, like, drink in my room. And my parents were super old, so they didn't—they were just oblivious. Um, I remember my friend was 
was talking to my mom one time, just wasted, and, like, fell down the staircase behind him, and my mom just didn't ask any questions. She didn't think anything of it. And I was like, okay. Um, but, yeah, basically, so I would drink with my friends in my room, and then I would just throw all the bottles that accumulated into my closet, and, like, after a while, like, they, a lot had accumulated, and so my mom went in my closet one day, and she found all these bottles, and she was just like, you're an alcoholic. I was like, that doesn't seem right. And uh, <laughs> and so uh, I remember, like, me and my mom were not getting along. And so we got in this fight, and I said some horrible things because I was not a nice person. And uh, my mom was like, do you want to go visit your sister? I like my sister. So I was like, okay. So I went to L.A. I visited my sister. I came back, and all the stuff in the house was packed. And she's like, we're moving to Los Gatos. And I was like, that sucks. Like, that was a trick. And... Uh, <laughs> And so, uh, I had a better plan, which was to run away to Santa Rosa, um, to preface my plans are usually horrible. Um, <laughs> this was no different. Um, but I didn't want my parents to find me, so I remember I, like, left a bunch of clues that I had ran away to Santa Barbara in my room, and, uh, <laughs> like, I ran out from, like, Greyhound to Santa Barbara and stuff, my parents <laughs> Like, I was only gone for three days, but my parents definitely went to Santa Barbara. And, uh, and so, like, I remember I was in Santa Rosa, and, uh, like, the first night was awesome, right? Like, I, I went to, like, a punk show, and I got super wasted, and then I, like, wound up at, like, at uh, some girl's house, and, like, I... I woke up, basically, and I guess I had thrown up all over her mom's bed and, like, everywhere, and uh, I just woke up, my hair is cut into a foot tall mohawk, and uh, I was like, that was awesome, right? Like, that was a win. And, um, but then, like, the next two nights, I was sleeping behind a McDonald's, and I was like, this isn't as cool. <laughs> like, I was 15, sleeping behind a McDonald's, I was like, this kind of sucks. And so, uh, basically, I called my mom, and uh, I was like, yeah, I want to come home, and uh, I was like, can you come pick me up? And she's like, no, because she doesn't like to drive on freeways. And uh, <laughs> literally what happened. <laughs> so one of my friends came and got me, and uh, one of my friend's parents came and got me. And uh, I remember my parents picked me up from my friend's house. And, like, last time they saw me, I just had long hair, and now I have, like, a foot-tall mohawk, and I just ran away. And, like, so they were not stoked to see me, really. And so they took me to this place in Fremont that was, like, a mental hospital or something. I don't really know what it was. They asked me all these questions, like, um, like if I was hearing voices and all this stuff, and, like, not yet. So, like, basically they just said, like, I wasn't the right fit for that place, and uh, my parents were didn't like that, and so they just, like, made me stay with my grandma in Zanesville, Ohio, for the whole summer. Um, but, yeah, basically I, I ended up moving to Los Gatos. Um, I hated Los Gatos. Uh, I did my freshman year of high school over again. It was super fun the first time. And, uh, and I don't know, like, it didn't take me long to, like, find people in Los Gatos that like to do, like, what I like to do, which is just drink and get messed up. Um, like, it was off-campus lunch, so basically meant you just didn't come back after lunch. Um, and, like, I don't know, like, like I said, like, I, I sucked at school, so I didn't really do anything. Like, I maintained a 0.00, .00 GPA in my whole high school career, um, which my whole high school career was just two freshman years, so. Um, <laughs> so basically, after about nine months, in Los Gatos, my parents, like, I had just been drinking all the time, like, I never showed up for school, and uh, my parents were like, this, because my parents just thought, like, I had shitty friends. Like, they just thought, like, if they got me away from Pleasanton, they got me away from these friends, that things would get better. And, like, they didn't realize that I had, like, basically found a solution for life, so, like, it didn't really matter. Um, and so, like... It didn't work out, right? Like, after nine months in Los Gatos, my parents were like, this was a horrible plan, right? Because I had just gotten so much worse. And so uh, I had a, I remember my parents went to Arizona for, like, a weekend, and, like, my parents didn't trust me at all. And so they made me stay at my friend's house and, like, took my house key away. But, like, I knew they would do that, so I made a copy of the house key. <laughs> and uh, I had a party in the house, but, like, the whole time, like, all these people were, like, sleeping in my house, but I was sleeping at my friend's house, so, like, they're just all unsupervised at my house. And, uh, and I don't know, like, I, 
We didn't leave any evidence, right? Like, except a blockbuster receipt, right? That was like from a day that they were gone, so they knew I was in the house. And uh, I remember they came back, we got in this huge fight. And uh, I don't know, like, like, by this time, like, I knew, like, I knew I shouldn't have been living the way I was living, right? Like, I wasn't doing anything, right? Like, I didn't do any school. Like, at this rate, I was just going to be a freshman forever, right? And uh, <laughs> that didn't sound cool, because I already started, like, a year late, so I was 16 and a freshman, and that was not that cool. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, basically, like, so we got in this fight after they came back from Arizona, and they asked, like, I didn't want to be living the way I was living already, right? Like... It had only been, like, a couple of years after I started drinking, but my life was already, like, going downhill, and I could see that. So, uh, I told my parents, basically, like, like, they wanted to move away, and they said, well, move if you can, like, get sober and stay sober. And, like, I was like, okay. So, they locked me in their house. I ended up doing independent study. I got, like, my GED. Um, and I stayed sober for nine months. Like, during that nine months, we moved from Los Gatos back to Pleasanton. And, uh, I don't know, like, it says in the big book, right, like, early in our drinking careers, we could have stopped, but, like, why would we want to, right? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like, why would I want to stop if I have found a solution for life? Like, it doesn't make any sense. And so, but, like, at that time, like, just getting out of where I was was enough of a reason, and I stayed sober on my own for nine months. And, uh... After living in Pleasanton for a few months, I remember I was working really hard at Arby's, and uh, my parents picked me up, it was Christmas, and they asked if I would help them move a Christmas tree in the house, and I'm a jerk, and so I said horrible things. I don't know why, but uh, basically, so they got really upset, they said some things, I said some more things, and like, somehow in my mind it turned into they were kicking me out, which I don't actually think is what happened. But it was just like an excuse in my mind to just bounce. And so uh, I bounced out of my parents' house, and I moved into an abandoned house uh, with a 32-year-old crackhead. And uh, I don't know, like, I was delusional, so, like, I thought I had my own place now, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like it had no windows or doors, but uh, whatever. Like, I remember me and my friends got a bunch of couches from, like, Goodwill and, like, furnished this abandoned house. And, uh... Like, <laughs> by this point, I just, I start drinking again, right? Because it doesn't make sense to stay sober. I was staying sober for my parents, so it's like, why not start drinking? I'm living in an abandoned house with 32-year-old crackhead. And, uh, and so I start drinking, and after about, like, two weeks in that abandoned house, I was like, it's freaking cold. There's no windows. And so, like, I basically begged my parents to, like, let me move back in. And so they're like, we'll stay sober, and we'll let you move back in. And uh, I stayed sober for, like, a minute, and I, they kicked me out again. And, like, that just happened, like, back and forth until, like, right before I turned 18. I remember I was in my friend's car, and, like, for some reason, like, he would go to, like, Hawaii all the time and, like, get tons of felony weapons and, like, somehow get them back here. Um, but basically, he just had them all in his minivan. And uh, we got pulled over by the cops, and uh, the cops found all these weapons. All I had was, like, cigarettes and I was 17, so they called my mom. And, uh, <laughs> I remember that, like, my mom was so upset, like, she, like, they gave her the cigarettes, and she just, like, crushed them, and, like, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so after that, like, it was just time to go, like, the cops basically told her I was so close to 18, like, that they could just kick me out, and so, I ended up, <laughs> I ended up just, uh, couch surfing, um, for years, um, I was really good at making friends with my friend's parents, which is good, like, if you don't want to do anything with your life. Um, <laughs> and so, like, they would just let me stay there for free. They'd, like, pay my phone bill and, like, buy me phones. And, like, it was pretty legit. Because, um, <laughs> like, I couldn't hold down a job, right? Like, that didn't make any sense. Like, I couldn't hold down a job. Like, I couldn't be an adult. By this time, like, like I counselor for years, like I said. When I was 18, um, I was walking in a crosswalk. And I got hit by a car. Um, and so when I was 20, I like fast forward, when I was 20, I got a check for $62,000, right? And like between that time of 18 and 20, a lot has happened, right? Like I'm still couch surfing. I'm just living at friends' houses. And uh, actually some funny stories, right? So I moved into this friend's house. And like 
like I was doing a bunch of coke with the kid, and then I ended up doing a bunch of meth with the mom. And like, they didn't know each other were doing drugs, right? It was just sketch. And, uh, but then like the husband accused me of a bunch of stuff and so they kicked me out. And uh, <laughs> so then I moved in with another friend who I was doing coke with. And then I ended up doing mess with her mom. It was very weird that I found both of these. Um, I, I don't know. Moms love mess or something. Like that. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, that was basically my life. I was just couch serving at these people's houses, um, doing lots of drugs, drinking all the time. Like, And so when I got that check for $62,000, I was like, it was pretty legit, right? Like, that's just what, like, an alcoholic needs. It's a check for $60,000 and no responsibilities. Um, and so, right afterwards, I discovered the Tenderloin in San Francisco. Um, that was a great place. I loved it so much that I just didn't leave the first week I was there. I just slept in my trunk, right? Because, like, all right, hear me out. Because <laughs> if you sleep in your car, they're going to see you in your car, right? Then they're going to knock on the window, they're going to arrest you, right? But if you're in the trunk, then they'll just give you a parking ticket. They don't know you're in there. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, I remember I was in the tender one for like a week, and by the end of this week, I'm just obliterated, right? Like, you don't know what the tender one is, it's just somewhere where you can get every drug you could think of. And, uh, and that is what I was doing, because I... <laughs> The first week I was there, I spent $10,000 just in the tender line. And, uh, and so I came back. I remember my girlfriend had no idea where I was that whole week. I just did not talk to anyone. Um, I came back. It was Valentine's Day. And I showed up at her work. Like, I just was parked outside of the Starbucks she worked at. I don't know why. Uh, but she came out, and she saw my car, and she uh, got in my car. And she's like, what are you doing here? I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't even know if I was saying actual words, but that's what I thought. <laughs> and uh, I just had all these pills in my hand. And she's like, what are you doing with those? I was like, I don't know. And, uh, and so then I hear a knock on the window, and it is a cop. And so I was like, I'm going to jail. That I didn't know. And, uh, <laughs> and so I did. Um, they didn't even have to sobriety test me. Like, I couldn't mouth words or walk. So uh, they just basically, like, opened the back door of the cop car, and I just went in and sat down. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, actually, I, I remember like, there was a bunch of methadone, and the cop was just like, where'd you get all this methadone? And I was like, from the methadone clinic. And he was like, which one? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, you are lying. I was like, <laughs> So, uh, basically, I went to jail, went to Santa Rita. Um, it's a great place. But uh, thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, one of those places that I couch surfed at, like, owned a bail bonds company. And so, by this time, I became a licensed bail bonds agent, which is awesome if you drink and love drugs. Um, and so, I got bailed out for free in five hours, um, which is crazy for Santa Rita. Um, so, basically, I got out and, like, in my life, that was the first consequence where I could actually connect the dots, right? Like, all throughout my life, like, living, like, house to house, like, couch serving, not being able to hold down jobs, like, my parents hating me, like, all of that was just, like, I'm a kid, that's just what's supposed to happen. Um, it's like what all my friends were doing, but they were shitty people, too. Um, and so, like, it wasn't until I got arrested, even only being there for five hours, I could actually see, like, the consequences. And so, I remember after that... I got sober, um, and, like, I went to court, and then they, like, pushed it back, and then I went to court again, and I had never been in trouble before, so they just ended up dismissing my charges, and I was like, <laughs> awesome, um, I'm invincible, obviously, and so I got loaded, <laughs> and, because, uh, I don't know, well, whatever, uh, so basically, I got loaded, um, it wasn't long after when I got arrested again, I think it was, like, nine months later. I got arrested. I think I was in jail for like 26 hours that time. I think only because I had taken so much Xanax they couldn't wake me up from my bunk. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, so then after I got out of jail the second time, uh, they put me on like a drug diversion. And uh, basically, uh, right before I started the drug diversion class, I got arrested again, which didn't go over well at court. Um, but by the third time I got arrested, I was just like, there's no hope of like, 
being sober, right? Like, after the first time, I was like, oh, I'm going to get my act together, I'll do this, everything will be all right. And, like, by the third time I got out, I was just like, no. Like, there's no, like, I just need to be loaded, right? Like, because every time, like, throughout the years that I was getting loaded, like, I would always find a reason to get sober, right? Like, I grew up in religion. I knew that, like, the way I was living was not the right way to live. Um, so I would try to get sober, and I would always go back. Uh, like, and I never knew why. Like, sure, like, like the book talks about, like, I came up with a reason that made sense at the time, but, like, in retrospect, it would not make any sense. And so, but by the third time, like, I got out of jail, it was just, like, I need to get loaded. There's no hope that I'm ever going to be sober, and this is just how life is. Like, I remember I was hanging out with a lot of, like, I was 20 at the time, and I was hanging out with a lot of people, like, in their 40s that were just doing dope and selling dope, and I was just, I saw, I was like, that is what my life is going to be. And, uh, and so I remember after I got out of jail the third time, um, by this point, I have no friends, really. Um, like, I have no friends. Like, my family doesn't really care for me. Um, that $60,000 was spent in, like, four months, by the way, um, with nothing to show for it. Um, and so when I got out of jail the third time, I had no one to really go to. Uh, the bail bonds company, like, I called them right after I got out, the one I was, they kept bailing them out for free. And they basically were like, you're fired, because we were bailing out too much. And, uh, <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> and so, uh, like, the only person I could think to call was my mom, right? Because I was at Santa Rita, and my car was, like, on the other side of Pleasanton. And uh, <coughs> I was like, I need to get in my car. So I called my mom. Like, uh, I didn't know it was her birthday, right? Because I'm loaded and don't care about people. And, uh... <laughs> And uh, so I called my mom, and uh, I was like, can you pick me up? And she's like, from where? I was like, from jail. And uh, <laughs> it's like, why would you tell your mom to go to jail all the time if you get bailed out for free, right? Um, and so my mom picks me up, and I remember my mom was like, do you want to be sober? And like, by this point, yes, I definitely wanted to be sober. But like I said, there's no hope of being sober. Like, that was just not going to happen. Um and so my mom thought, like, well, why don't we do what we did in Los Gatos? We'll just lock you in the house. You won't be able to leave. You get sober, right? Seems like a foolproof plan. And uh, so she takes me to my car. Obviously, there's drugs in the car. So I get loaded on the way to her house. And uh, they lock me in the house. They have my psychotic brother, like, move in and, like, just sleep downstairs so I can't escape. And, uh, <laughs> like, is it? Really, they wanted the best for me, right? Like, my life was just going downhill, and, like, everyone could see it, and, like, like I said, like, everything was just shit by this point. And so, uh, I couldn't be sober, though, right? Like, like, all that fear that, like, alcohol and drugs, like, got rid of when I started, right? Like, by this point, I have done so many shitty things. There's so much more to cover up, right? Like, I don't need to just cover up the fear. I need to cover up the regret, the remorse, the shame, like... I have just been a piece of shit for years now. And so, like, I just couldn't be, lo like, couldn't be sober. And so my parents locked me in the house. Um, I think I stayed sober for, like, three days. And then I tied a rope to a bucket. I threw it out my window. I got people to drop off drugs in the bucket, and I got loaded. And, uh, <laughs> which confused my parents. <laughs> it was obvious I was loaded and I had not left the house. And, uh, and so, like, my parents put up with it for, like, a minute, right? Like, I stayed there for probably another week after I started getting loaded. I remember one night I was able to sneak out and, uh, I was, like, being an idiot and, like, drifting my car, spun out of my mind, and I spun it into a sidewalk. And, uh, after this point, like, my car is no longer working. Like, throughout, when I was getting loaded, like, this car, I had crashed, like, 12 times. I was a terrible driver. <laughs> Some say I still am. But, <laughs> basically, uh, I remember my wheel was bent. I'm, like, driving it back to my parents' house, so they don't know that I snuck out. And, like, it's just, it's terrible. And, <laughs> but then I call my insurance, right, because I had full coverage. I was like, I can get money. And so, uh... I like money. Um, so I call the insurance. They come out. They uh, look at the car. And I don't know why my mom never asked me, actually, like, how did she just, how is this car not working now? Like, you shouldn't have left. Um, but basically, my insurance sent me a check for $3,000. So after I got that money, I just disappeared, right? Like, I got out of my parents' house. And I had a really good plan. 
right? Because life sucked. I had no friends. I had no one. And, like, I didn't really want to live. Right? Like, I didn't want to live. I couldn't kill myself. Like, I had all these ideas of, like, religion. Like, well, like, maybe hell is worse than this. I don't know. Like, if it exists. Like, and then there was always the thought of, like, what if it gets better? Right? Like, but it just, it never seemed to get better. So I don't know why that was a thought. Um... So basically, I got this check for three thousand dollars, and I had a really good plan. I got a Motel Six. Um, I got a big bottle of vodka. I got some meth, some coke, some oxy, some Xanax, and some heroin. I tried to die. Right? Because if you die of alcohol poisoning or a drug overdose, that's a loophole into heaven. At least that's how my brain thinks. Uh, <laughs> and uh, obviously, I didn't die. Right? My plan to usually fail. And so. I was in the motel for like a week until I ran out of money. Um, all that did happen is I went into a drug psychosis and I ripped out two of my own teeth with a pair of tweezers. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> They're all fake. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so I remember I, I ran out of money. So you can't stay in a hotel if you don't have money. And so I'm just walking around in Pleasanton. I remember it was like, it was May of 2010. And I was walking around, and, like, there was, I remember there was, like, holes in my shoes, and it was raining, and I was just like, this sucks. All right? Like, there's so many other times where, like, shit hit the fan, and I'm just like, if I do this, or if I do this, things will be all right. All right? Like, I remember, like, way back, uh, right after I got hit by the car, I was doing a lot of meth, and I was, like, 98 pounds. It was terrible. And, like, I remember, like, shit hit the fan that time, and I was like, I need to get sober. My parents were like, okay, we'll send you to rehab. And, uh, but then it, like, took them too long to find one, so by that point, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna smoke weed and drink. And, uh, like, desperation is fleeting, right? Like, I always come up with a good plan. But this time, I was like, there was no plan. Like, there was no, I couldn't think of any idea of how anything was gonna get better. And, uh, so the only person I could think to call was my mom, because really that's the only person who would probably answer my phone call at this point. And, uh, so I remember I called my mom, and, uh, she asked if I would go to rehab. And I was like, I didn't know if rehab would help, but at this point I'm like sleeping outside, so like that sounds cooler than uh, sleeping outside. And so I was like, okay, I'll go. And so uh, I remember I went to rehab, uh, like May 31st, 2010, and like, like I said, I didn't know it was going to help. I didn't really know what rehab was. Um, all right. <laughs> like I didn't know like... I didn't know if things were going to be better. I just knew my life sucked. I, I knew my life sucked, and something had to change. And I was willing to try anything at this point because, like I said, like I didn't have any plan of how it was going to get better. It's not like I was like, if I get this money, things will get better. If I get this girl, things will get better. If I get this spot, things will get better. Like that was always the idea before. But like this time, I was like, I had had all of that, and none of none of it made anything better. And so. I went to rehab, um, and I remember, like, at first I didn't want to do anything, um, and, like, they had all these assignments, and I didn't want to do anything, and I remember this girl one day was just like, do you want to be sober? I was like, yeah, I want to be sober. She's like, well, then why don't you do whatever it takes to be sober? And, like, living my life, I had always just lived with a theory of I'm going to do nothing and get everything in return, all right? Like, that is how I live my life, and somewhat successfully, I guess, <laughs> for a while, right? Like, I didn't have to hold down a job or anything. And, like, this this is the first time where I realized, like, I was actually, actually going to have to do something for things to get better. And so uh, I started doing assignments in the rehab. Um, I remember, like, I did every single assignment they had at the rehab because I realized that the assignments were giving me a relief, which is really what I've always been looking for, right? Like, I've always been looking for something to make me feel better. Like, that is what the alcohol did when I found it, right? Like, it got rid of that fear got rid of later that shame, that regret, that remorse. It made me feel all right. It's like, when I started doing the assignments, I started to feel all right. And so, like, they brought a lot of H&I meetings into the place. I'm sure they all said the same thing. Like, when you get out, get a sponsor, do the steps, blah, blah, blah. Go to 90 meetings in 90 days. Um, when I got out, though, the only thing that sounded convenient was going to 90 meetings in 90 days. Because that sounded like the least amount of work. Um, and so I just did that, right? Like, I was in San Jose. I went to rehab down there. And uh, I didn't know anyone. I didn't have any friends. I didn't have a job. And I was in an SLE. And so, like, I just went to meetings all day. I was going to, like, four or five meetings every day. Um, but after about 80 days, like, life still sucked, right? Like, 80 days sober, my life is terrible, right? Like, I just feel terrible. 
whenever I'm not at a meeting. Like, I thought I was doing Alcoholics Anonymous just because I sat in a chair, right? Like, I thought I was doing something because I was here. Like, really, I was just doing the same thing I always did, which was nothing. And so, uh, after 80 days, I finally, I did what they say in here, and I got a sponsor. And, like, I didn't have any faith in this guy. Like, he was only, like, a year older than me and only had, like, a year sober. But, like, what he did was, like, he just went through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous with me. And, like, and that is what I needed to get the relief. Like, um... And so, like, as I went through the book, I, I started to understand the problem, right? Because at that 80 days, I still thought if I stayed away from alcohol and drugs long enough, I would be okay. Like, I just need to separate myself for long enough, and then things will work out. The longer I'm away, the worse I feel, and the crazier I am. And it's like, I start to understand the actual problem. Is that, basically how the book breaks it down, is right? Like, the physical allergy, the mental obsession, and the spiritual malady, right? Like, when I drink, I don't act like other people, right? Like, I... I just keep going. But that doesn't happen every time, right? And I'm going to only remember the times it doesn't happen, right? This mental obsession tells me, like, you feel like shit. Why don't you make yourself feel better? Drink. You won't go to jail. You just got out of jail. What's the likelihood you'll go back? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but then I have this spiritual malady, which is really the problem, right? I don't feel good as myself. To me, sobriety sucks. Like, that is the bottom line. Sobriety is terrible. And it's like, unless I find a sufficient substitute, right, which I found in alcohol, it's like, I'm not going to stay sober. And so, like, if, if sobriety sucks and my brain constantly tells me, like, good ideas of how to get loaded, eventually I'm going to get loaded. Like, and when I realized that that was a pattern of my life, like, I realized how screwed I was. When I realized how screwed I was, the rest of the steps sounded really appealing. And so I started going through them. Like, I think it only took me, like, six months to get through all the steps after I started after that, like, 80 days. And, like, each step, I just got more and more relief, right? Like, I got more relief from being me. And, like, thankfully, like, my sponsor, after, like, the fifth step, was like, go sponsor people. I'm like, that sounds terrible. And, uh, but, like, I did, right? Like, I just sat and I started reading with people. And I started giving back. And I started doing the same thing you did with me. Like, I talked to a lot of people and they are like, very scared to sponsor people because they, like, some reason think that this other person's life is in their hands for some reason. I don't know why. Um, it's like you can't keep yourself sober, so you're going to keep this person sober. Um, but basically, it's like I just do what my sponsor did. I just read page by page in the big book. And the big book says, do this. I say, do that. <laughs> this is how I did it. Like That's all I have to do. I don't need to think of any plans. I don't need to give them any great ideas. My ideas suck. Um, and then I continue to do that. And like... So my sobriety date is May 31st, 2010. Uh, I just had like six years a few months ago, and a lot has happened in that time, right? Like I definitely like stopped doing things, like and just came up with really good ideas of like I'm gonna do nothing, or like I'm gonna exercise more, or, I'm gonna do this, and like they usually just fall apart very quickly. I start hating everyone, um, and like my life becomes terrible. And somehow I stay sober through it. Because thankfully, like, the same principles always apply, right? Like, no matter how far away I get away, like, no matter how far I go from, like, doing what I'm supposed to do here, it's like I can just go back to doing the same thing, which is trust God, clean house, work with others, all right? Like, that's all I ever have to do. It's like I don't have to think of anything new, right? Like, I don't have to do anything new. I just, I come to meetings, I work with other guys, and, like, life gets all right. It's like, so I don't know. Like, I'm running out of time. I think I got talked about loaded way too much. But uh, it's like, I can't say enough about AA because my life has became incredible in a way I never thought I deserved. Right? Like, I never thought I would be okay sober. Like I said, sobriety sucked. Like, sobriety was terrible. Like, I never thought I would be okay. And, like, I am more than okay. Like, I feel pretty content most of the time. It's like, sure, like, life happens, and, like, I make terrible decisions, and, like, things go to shit, but then I can just go back to doing the same thing. Like, I just go back to helping other people. When I continue to help other people, like, I feel better. Because, like, the book talks about the, the problem is I'm selfish and self-centered, right? Like, I'm selfish and self-centered, and I just want to do what's good for me. And, like, that doesn't really serve me well. 
So it's like once I start doing stuff in Alcoholics Anonymous, I start helping other people, like my life becomes incredible. Like I have an amazing job. I have a place to live. My family loves me. Like I have more friends than I know what to do with. It's like, and that's all because of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's all because of doing the simple stuff that's suggested here, which is, it very, it really is simple, right? It's like clean house, trust God, work with others. That's all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.